Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in everyday listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1. Look at questions 1 to 4. Good evening, everyone. This evening, I'm going to continue last week's lecture by talking more about how people spend their money. First of all, I'm going to compare how people of different age groups spend their cash. You probably know that there's a lot of difference between what young people do with their money, how families spend their money, and what more mature people do. Secondly, I want us to think about what we imagine men and women spend their money on. And then I'm going to look at male and female spending patterns and see whether we were right. OK, to start with, let's divide the population into three sections. Let's say uh, young people up to the age of 30 in the first group. Then um, let's put families in the 30 to 55 year old group. So that puts adults over 55 in the mature group. Does that make sense? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Right, well, I found that the first group, that's young people up to the age of 30, mostly spend their money on clothes, music and entertainment. That's not really very surprising, is it? Although, I must admit, I thought they might spend a lot on cars and travelling around. So, the next group is what I've called families, people in the age group from 30 to 55. Naturally, as I expected, this group spends most of its money on food, toys and trips out. But I was surprised to find that people aged between 30 and 55 spend most of their money on furniture and kitchen equipment. I suppose it's logical if you think about it. People are usually improving their homes at that age and household equipment is very expensive. But they also spend a lot of money on electronic equipment like video games for the children. Now turning to the third group, that's people over 55. I thought they'd spend their money on gardening tools and electronic equipment, but I was wrong again. People in the over 55s group spend most money on new cars and days out. So, what did we think about how men and women spend their money? OK. Well, we thought that young women would spend a lot on clothes and shoes and that young men would buy more electronic equipment and cars. Well, when we look at the figures, we can see that we were right about the men. Young men spend twice as much as women on cars and computers. But, and this is interesting, we were wrong about the women. I was surprised to find that young women spend much more on beauty treatments than they do on clothes and shoes. So we'll have to think about that again. And there's another interesting fact about young women. It looks as though young women are much more concerned about their diet than men. We found that although young women don't spend as much as men on eating out, they do spend a lot more on organic foods than young men. 
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a talk about young people living on their own. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 12. Loneliness is something we all suffer from in varying degrees, but young people living on their own can be particularly vulnerable. Many who leave the family home find they are less confident and have more difficulty in finding their feet than they expected. Often, going to work or study in another town or city will be the first time they have lived away from home. Although this may sound like an adventure for those dying to get away from the glare of the parental eye, for others, it is a daunting prospect which generates apprehension, uncertainty and even fear. In fact, in a recent survey of over 1,600 people who had recently left home, 32% said that understanding and coping with loneliness was a crucial issue for them and made them feel highly stressed and distracted. An annual report by researchers last year recorded a noticeable increase in the number of individuals with homesickness, transition and isolation issues. Acknowledging that feelings of loneliness and isolation could impede progress at work or study, they examined the number of people using the welfare and health services. They found that young people in particular were prone to difficulties. Last year, 61% of all people using counselling services were aged under 30. And of this group, 57% were men. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at question 13 to 20. Leaving home involves a major change in lifestyle, work patterns and degree of independence. You will be away from home, family and friends and are no longer supported by familiar surroundings. For this reason, in the first year a lot of young people suffer from loneliness. Ironically, this sense of isolation comes at a time when you are likely to be surrounded by people most of the time. Living in a busy city, travelling on crowded buses and trains, you will be constantly among people. But this can sometimes compound your sense of being alone. Seeing others who appear at ease among large crowds, mingling and making friends, can make you feel excluded and inadequate. Adapting to a new environment makes people uncertain of what to do or how to behave and breeds insecurities which can make for a real sense of isolation. It is often those who are more used to being on their own who deal best with the transitional period of leaving home. Other reasons for feeling alone include high expectations of the big city where you have the best time of your life and meet lifelong friends it may be the first time you have had to make new friends since you started primary school and perhaps you are reluctant or finding it hard to replace old friends whom you miss. There are also pressures to juggle work and socialising which may leave you feeling left out. 
Or it could be that you have a long-distance relationship and feel torn between your new lifestyle and that special person who lives so far away. Because loneliness can leave you with a sense of low self-esteem, where you become self-conscious and feel you have been rejected, it is very difficult to overcome. You may be reluctant to even try and make new friends or take part in social activities and will also find it difficult to say no to things, leaving you feeling exploited and weak. One of the ways of combating loneliness is to remember that it's not your fault and that it's something everyone has to deal with, despite appearances. Counsellors advise those feeling lonely to speak to someone they know about their feelings. They also ask them to consider joining groups and societies and to get involved in activities which interest them as a way of meeting more people. Of course, overdoing it and jamming your schedule with too many things just to avoid being alone will not work. But meeting others with common interests may be a step forward. If you still feel like you need someone to talk to, you could try group counselling, where you will be able to talk to and receive support from a small number of people with the same difficulties as you. For more information, or to be put in touch with an individual counsellor, contact the local town hall support services. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You hear two students, Louisa and Michael, telling their tutor about an art exhibition they are putting on as part of a university project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. So, Louisa and Michael, how are your plans for the university art show going? This project makes up 80% of your mark for the event planning course. So I hope everything is running smoothly. Have you had any problems, Louisa? Nothing we can't handle, but yes. Even an event as simple as this one has had its problems. We had anticipated we might have some hiccups, particularly with the artists, and despite this, the show is going to open tomorrow. Just to give you a quick summary of what the art show is, we are having a one-week exhibition of works from university students who are artists. There are 30 paintings in the exhibition, and this evening they are going to be hung on the walls of the Anderson Room in the university's exhibition building. The show opens tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Thank you, Michael. How did you both decide who was going to do what in the organization of the exhibition? I'm in control of selection and logistics for movement of the artwork. And Michael has organized the event itself. I think it has been a quite even distribution of work. First, we decided on a theme for the exhibition together, which is Old Meets New. We found that the students in the Fine Arts Faculty have the greatest variation in age at the university, and we wanted to highlight this contrast. Their oldest student is 80. The students have been very enthusiastic about it. Were there any complaints that the theme was ageist? On the contrary, people thought it was age-inclusive. The university already has an exhibition for young artists, which excludes students over 40. How did you publicize the exhibition? I used social media and direct email to all fine arts students, asking them to submit 
digital images of their paintings. I also posted notices around the other faculties, hoping to attract any artists who were not studying fine arts. Did you? Just three engineering students? In all, we got 400 entries. From those digital images, we narrowed them down to the 30 we are showing. We only have enough space to hang that many paintings. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. How was the selection process made? We decided not to use any of the academic staff as judges to ensure impartiality, but asked three independent people to judge, a prominent art dealer and two established practicing artists. All three of them are graduates from this university. They made the exhibition selection from the digital images two weeks ago. They are coming in to the university this afternoon to decide on the winners. They particularly ask to be able to see the actual paintings before making a decision. So, we still don't know who the winners are. I understand why you didn't want the university staff judging it, but I think I should go along to the judging this afternoon to make sure everything runs smoothly. How are you paying for the exhibition? There have been very few costs. The hanging space has been offered to us for free and we have volunteers from the fine arts faculty who are helping to hang and take down the works. There will be some refreshments served at the opening, but these have been donated by a sponsor. Another thing, most of the artists have agreed to offer their paintings for sale, but we decided not to take a percentage from this. We thought that it would be just too difficult to manage the finances, and there was no need to fund anything anyway. If someone wants to buy a painting, they can deal directly with the artist. It sounds like it is all proceeding very well. Have you thought about what you will do if the artists don't collect their paintings when the show comes down? Yes, we are prepared for that. We have short-term storage space in the Fine Arts Department, the same space we have been keeping the paintings as they have arrived. The gallery space itself has to be cleared and cleaned within 24 hours, so we included a clause in the competition application form that states paintings must be retrieved within a 10-day period or they will be disposed of. Did you have a lawyer look at the terms and conditions before you posted them? Yes, Professor Watkins in the law faculty helped me write them from scratch. Excellent. And what is the prize for the competition? Just the glory, I'm afraid. We decided not to offer a cash prize. Professor Watkins said there would be less legal complications that way. Certificates will be awarded by the Vice-Chancellor of the University. She says that if the exhibition is a success, the University might hold it again next year. Well done. Let's meet again next week at the same time. But I'll be coming to the opening, of course. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a part of a lecture about sharks. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
About 500 species of sharks exist today. Many of them look like the dorsal-finned, sharp-toothed predator that incites fear in most people's imaginations. But there are other species that resemble this idea less with flatter, longer or rounder body shapes that adapt them to the multitude of undersea environments. Evidence of fossils show that at one time there were more than 3,000 different shark-like species that have their beginnings about 450 million years ago when there were few creatures in the sea and even fewer on land. It seems sharks arose from a group of fish called Acanthodians, which looked much like the sharks of today, but smaller. Their teeth grew in a similar way, a continual replacement process starting off inside the mouth and not set in the jaw, growing forward, getting larger and larger. Sharks produce thousands of teeth during their lifetimes, with new teeth emerging every few days. The first fish that can be truly identified as sharks arrived about 50 million years later in the early Devonian period when most life on Earth was in the seas. This growing diversity of sea life led to the Devonian also being called the Age of Fishes. This first shark is called the Leonodus. Though little is known about it due to only its teeth being found, it was more than likely eel-shaped and about 40 centimetres long and probably a member of a family of freshwater sharks. The study of shark evolution is almost completely based on the study of tooth fossils. From the teeth we can ascertain where they lived, what they ate and what other shark species they were related to even today. Flatter teeth suggest a diet of crushing mollusks and crustaceans, while fine pointy teeth are easier for catching fish. Sharks that eat large animals like seals have multiple rows of triangular serrated teeth. A huge growth in the different varieties of sharks began about 360 million years ago during the Carboniferous period. The mass extinction that had occurred at the end of the Devonian period due to a combination of sea level and atmospheric gas changes, tectonic plate movement and asteroid impacts had actually been beneficial to sharks. Many species disappeared, but those that survived had diversified under such environmental pressure. It was during this period that sharks got bigger and many species grew to the size we know them today. During the Jurassic period, which started 200 million years ago, sharks with flexible jaws emerged. These jaws meant they were able to attack much larger fish and their position as the great ocean predator became established. Different features began to emerge in the varied environments that we recognize as shark-like. Their snouts became more sensitive and began to protrude. A tail fin enabled them to swim faster for long distances to catch prey. The sharks that were thriving at this time continued well into the Cretaceous period, which ended 65 million years ago, when dinosaurs and many other animals were wiped out by an asteroid hitting the Earth. Sharks lived on by continuing to diversify. It was after this great extinction period that the largest number of new species appeared. The new families of sharks that emerged and survived this period were those that continued to develop into most of the shark species that exist today. They had survived some of the most devastating geological changes this planet has seen, and the result was a group of highly adapted predators at the top of the food chain. For the next 50 million years there was little to stop them, but now they are under threat. Fishing, pollution, climate change and habitat destruction all point to their possible demise. Humans kill enormous numbers of sharks that they fish for their meat and fins. Many are on the list of endangered species, particularly the whale shark and the great white shark, which are mainly caught for their meat. Deep-sea sharks are also at risk, as they can't reproduce fast enough to make up for their losses from being fished. 
they are sought after for their liver oil, which contains substances used in the cosmetic industry. Many shark species are not protected, which allows for their unlimited slaughter. Populations are being reduced at an extreme rate, and estimates show that a quarter of sharks are now threatened with extinction. Urgent action needs to be taken to promote population recovery. If this does not happen, the future of sharks is very uncertain. What was once the great survivor of the sea, continuing to exist for millions of years despite great natural catastrophes that killed off so many other animals, is now facing its greatest challenge. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.